Yeah, so uh, I take it um, uh, effective altruists have paid quite a lot of attention to questions about domestic animals, farmed animals, uh, tens of billions of uh, animals get factory farmed every year causes a tremendous amount of suffering also harms not only the animals but human beings the environment etc um there are a number of uh very effective organizations that people support um the humane league the good food institute places like this um it's not only a very big problem but a very under-resourced problem so maybe um uh, quite a lot of room to do good with donations. Um, but of course, the vast majority of uh, animal suffering in the world uh, likely happens among uh, wild animals. Um, probably trillions of wild vertebrates, so maybe something like quintillions of wild invertebrates. Uh, we don't know exactly where the cutoff for consciousness is, but kind of the easier it is, the more wild animal suffering there's going to be. Um, most of these animals probably die young. Uh, uh, well, most of them do die quite young. Uh, others are subject um, to, you know, continual sources of stress, suffering. Um, uh, we know that there are some things that we can do to improve the condition of wild animals because we've done them for um, basically selfish reasons, spreading vaccines among wild animal populations so that they won't serve as a reservoir for rabies that could be passed on to human beings. Or uh, there's uh, uh, a parasite called the New World screw worm, um, which uh, uh, I mean, human beings who, who I mean, it burrows into your skin uh, and then uh, human beings who have this, apparently it's so painful that you have to be anesthetized before doctors can even examine the wound. Um, and uh, those have been eliminated from uh, North America um, because they posed a threat to livestock populations, this sort of stuff. Um, so it looks like we might be able to do uh, more things consciously with the intentional aim of helping wild animals if we wanted to, right? Um, there are organizations like the Wild Animal Initiative for Animal Ethics that uh, investigate ways that we might do this. Um, there are also some philosophers, people like uh, Jeff McMahon, David Pierce, Kyle Newhansen, um, who have advocated sort of more drastic uh, kind of science fictional measures, things that we can't do now, but might be able to do in the future, maybe use gene drives to ultimately eliminate predation um, or to make animals more resistant to disease or to the elements or whatever, um, kind of radically re-engineer the natural order uh, in order to uh, uh, increase the flourishing of the animals in it. Um, Hard to know, you know, cost effectiveness of these sorts of things right now. A lot of them uh, highly speculative, hard to figure out the overall impact, this sort of stuff. Um, but in potentially the benefits could be very great, right? Um, worth noting, lots of effective altruists work within sort of a broadly utilitarian framework that treats uh, human and animal interests equally important. Um, but even if you don't agree with that, even if you think human interests are sort of uh, pound for pound more important, um, the, the sheer fact that there's so much in the way of animal interests here uh, might lead you to think that this is a very high priority area, right? Um, and it's also worth pointing out, it's plausible to think that we underestimate intuitively how bad wild animal suffering might be. Um, because of things like scope and sensitivity, the fact that we know that people don't take, that their intuitions aren't appropriately sensitive to large numbers. Uh, we ask you, how, how much would you be willing to pay to save a thousand birds from an oil spill? And people say, uh, $25. And we ask, what about a hundred thousand birds? And people say, $27. You know, it, it, it's, I mean, really, at some point, you know, the intuition is just this is like more birds than I can than I can imagine. And it, you stop responding to the numbers or status quo bias. People like like how things are, regardless of how things are. 
um, and and because you know this is the natural way of things. Now uh, th these sorts of things. Um, at the same time, um, at least when it comes to some of the the more extensive uh, interventionist proposals, gene drives, that sort of thing. There are quite a lot of philosophers, including some who are pretty prominent pro-animal rights philosophers, who are not so hot on this. Um, they've argued either that we wouldn't be obliged to do this, or even that it would be wrong to do this. Um, and generally, this is because they think we don't stand in the right sort of uh, relationships to wild animals for this to be um, uh, either permissible or obligatory, depending on their exact position. Um, they might think, for instance, uh, that uh, wild animal communities essentially are like sovereign nations and we shouldn't interfere with them uh, in this sort of way. Um, and I'll talk later about some other things that they think. Um, I also imagine that some Christians will probably be a little wary of some of these proposals. You might worry about intervening in the natural order, uh, worry that it's, um, a form of playing God, something like that. Um, particularly if you think we should heavily discount the interests of wild animals, um, you might be uh, sympathetic to this sort of thing. Um, so uh, here's, here's my argument. Um, so I published this paper in religious studies called Human Dominion and Wild Animal Suffering. Um, and this is sort of a pro intervening to help wild animals argument um, that is grounded in a certain interpretation of the dominion command uh, from Genesis. Um, and uh, so it, it provides kind of a specifically Christian uh, argument in favor of intervention. Um, it also, if correct, would undermine some of the, uh, the, the secular mainstream philosophical arguments against intervention uh, that I mentioned. Um, I, I will note, my inclination is to think those arguments also fail on independent sort of purely philosophical grounds. Um, so the suggestion that wild animal communities are like sovereign nations and we shouldn't interfere, I mean, if you take that analogy seriously, wild animal communities would, I mean, if they were human states, they would be failed states, right? Um, because they can't secure um, basic protections for their members uh, against assault and, and uh, deprivation and this sort of stuff. Um, so they would be uh, prime, prime candidates for humanitarian intervention of some sort. Um, and I have things to say about the other arguments too. Um, so it's not like I think that the anti-intervention arguments would work absent the argument that I'm going to give. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, it's nice to have multiple lines uh, of argument converging for the same conclusion, I guess, right? Um, so, uh, what is this Dominion Command? Uh, very famous passage in Genesis 1. Uh, God uh, gives humans uh, dominion over all the creatures of the earth. Um, two, two broad ways that you might interpret uh, the command. In the paper, I give them perhaps slightly prejudicial names. Um, one I call uh, the not very nice interpretation. Um, and the not very nice interpretation views the dominion here as um, sort of absolute arbitrary authority, something like what uh, a despot claims over their subjects, or uh, I might claim over, uh, you know, a box of tissues or something like that. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you can just dispose uh, of this thing however you want. Um, Elizabeth Anderson draws a distinction between private government and public government, where under private government, government is seen as just sort of the leader's personal business. Whereas on public government, it's everybody's business and it has to be justifiable to the people being governed. Um, the not very nice interpretation to use human dominion as private government. Um, and this has been a, a problem, maybe a, a dominant uh, interpretation historically. Um, on the other hand, uh, the nice interpretation views dominion as more like the authority claimed by, say, a legitimate government or a trustee who's acting on your behalf uh, or parents over children or 
uh, maybe the older sibling who's been left in charge while the parents step out, something like that. Um, it's uh, authority that is supposed to be exercised for the good of um, the governed. Um, and so it's, it's primarily a responsibility rather than a privilege. In fact, sometimes it even requires that the governing person place, uh, prioritize the interests of whoever they're governing, right? Um, this is sort of a stewardship model uh, of dominion. And this has been defended by people like Carol, Carol Adams, Richard Balcom, David Clo, uh, Andrew Lindsay, John Hare, and so forth. Um, and uh, I'm going to defend uh, the nice interpretation and then uh, draw some further distinctions and defend a certain interpretation of the nice interpretation. Um, so one, one problem with the not very nice interpretation is that it doesn't fit very well with some other biblical texts. Um, among other things, it doesn't fit very well with the uh, immediately following sentence where God commands everyone to be vegans. Um, so if that's right, then it doesn't seem like um, the, the dominion command entails that you can do whatever you want to animals, because actually at that point, uh, you have dominion, but you're not supposed to be eating them. Um, predation only um, is instituted later on um, alongside capital punishment. Uh, it, there's still uh, a prohibition against eating lifeblood, which is interesting in various ways. Um, immediately after um, allowing uh, human predation, God makes a covenant with Noah and with all flesh. Um, so God apparently views other animals um, as uh, individuals with whom one can make a, a covenant and be bound by it. Um, uh, and then um, it, there are these sort of messianic or eschatological um, pictures of uh, predation going away again. Um, so it looks like somehow or other, uh, you know, predation is some sort of response to uh, our, our suboptimal uh, post-fall condition. Um, and uh, ultimately it's, it's bound to be gotten rid of. Um, and that doesn't fit very well with, with the thought that from the beginning we're given uh, this kind of tyrannical authority over uh, other animals. Um, there are also other passages that seem to command humane treatment of animals. Uh, this passage in Proverbs, the righteous know the needs of their animals, but the mercy of the wicked is cruel. Um, there are various commands in the Mosaic law that seem to be motivated by concern for uh, humane treatment of animals. Um, and in the Talmud, this is actually abstracted into this more general principle saying you shouldn't cause unnecessary suffering. Um, Jesus doesn't say very much directly about the ethical treatment of animals, but he does say some things which seem to presuppose uh, that they have uh, value and merit humane treatment. Um, and you get the sense maybe he doesn't say very much directly about it because he takes this to be common ground um, between himself and his, uh, his uh, discussion partners. Um, so for instance, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The, high, uh, the hired hand, who is not the shepherd, uh, does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. But I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and, I, and my own know me, and I lay down my life for my sheep. And sometimes people think, well, that's really about Jesus, not about animals, right? So like, what is, what is, the, but uh, I guess the literal reading of what he's saying has to make sense, right? For the, the point he's making about himself to make sense. Uh, if he was like, the good shepherd never leaves his sheep, even for a second, for any reason, then you would think, wait, that's not true. You know? um, uh, and so if the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep, that's a pretty, that's a pretty robust um, picture. Um, he also, uh, you know, when he's criticized for healing on the Sabbath, um, he, uh, he uh, says, well, you know, obviously it's okay to pull an animal out of a ditch on the Sabbath, isn't it? Um, and so if you can do that sort of good thing, why not do this other sort of good thing? Um, and uh, Richard Balkum at least thinks that this must be 
the reason it's okay to pull the animal out must be grounded in some sort of concern for the animal because probably the animal is not going to die if you wait until tomorrow or something like that. It's just going to be bad for the animal. Um, there's this uh, also, you know, this famous passage about uh, not a not a sparrow falls without uh, God knowing about it. Um, uh, all of these, it seems like, and again, Richard Bauckham, and he he has this uh, book called um, "Living with Fellow Creatures," I think, um, where he he argues all of these events some sort of concern uh, for ethical treatment uh, of individual animals. A um, little bit, oh, I can just skip over this. Um, it is worth noting there there is a, an alternate form of argument in this in these sparrow passages. There is an alternate form of argument that you find in the Talmud uh, occasionally, which presupposes that the, the sparrows and wild animals actually have no independent value. Uh, the arguments goes, uh, uh, well, um, God knows about these wild animals and takes care of them, even though they serve no purpose except uh, to help me out. Um, and that's actually, if I mean, if you accept that premise, that's a stronger argument, right? But um, that's actually not the form of the argument that Jesus gives. He doesn't suggest that the sparrows have no value of their own at all. Um, uh, you might also think there's kind of this general uh argument from jesus's model of leadership uh in general you know uh it doesn't seem like leadership and dominion granted by god are supposed to be exercised uh tyrannically um there's also this little i include this partly just because it's such an interesting story there's this little apocryphal story that bauckham uh talks about uh where uh, they find a man with a pack mule, but the animal had fallen because the man had loaded it too heavily and now he beat it so that it was bleeding. And Jesus came to him and said, man, why do you beat your animal? Do you not see that it's too weak for its burden? And do you not know that it suffers pains? But the man answered and said, what is that to you? I may beat it as much as I please since it's my property and I bought it for a good sum of money. Ask those who are with you. And the disciples of course say, yeah, he bought it. Um, but the Lord said, do you not know how, see how it bleeds? Do you not hear how it groans and cried out? And they said, no, we haven't been paying any attention to that. Uh, so Jesus was sad and exclaimed, woe to you that you do not hear how it complains to the creator in heaven and cries out for mercy, but threefold woes to him about whom it cries out and complains in its pain. And he came up and touched the animal and healed the animal. Uh, and Jesus said, now carry on from now and from now on do not beat it anymore so that you too may find mercy. Uh, and Bauckham says, well, we don't actually know the origin of this story. We don't know how early it is, uh, but uh, whatever its source, I mean, it made, some, it made sense if it's a, just, a, you know, some later made up story, it made sense for to somebody to make it up, right? Um, he thinks, well, this sort of fits with how Jesus is portrayed in the Gospels. Um, you might think that about, say, the story of the woman caught in adultery, which is, you know, this later edition and, and so forth. Um, anyway, you might think, you might worry, well, aren't there other passages that push in other directions? And we can talk about those in the Q&A if we need to. Um, but uh, there's also what I call the philosophical problem for the not very nice interpretation, which is just that on independent ethical grounds, uh, it's hard to believe that we don't have any obligations to animals, can treat them however we see fit. Um, there's a, a famous thought experiment from Robert Nozick where he asked you to imagine, uh, you feel like snapping your fingers to the beat of some music, uh, and you know that somehow or other, this is gonna cause 10,000 contented unowned cows to die after great pain. Uh, would it be perfectly all right to snap your fingers? And of course, the answer is supposed to be no, right? Um, so uh, it, it just seems pretty uh, pretty hard to believe uh, that we have uh, no obligations to animals in general, right? Um, and that uh, that pushes away again from from the uh, the not very nice interpretation. Um, uh, so on these grounds, I suggest we should um, favor this interpretation where dominion is sort of stewardship meant to be exercised somehow or other for the good of animals. Um, but having adopted that, we can distinguish between two different versions. Um, what we might call the environmentalist interpretation focuses on um, 
aggregates of animals. You might think we should promote the good of species, biodiversity, things like that, not worry about the welfare of individual animals. Um, uh, Elizabeth Anderson notes the environmentalist object of concern is typically an aggregate or system, a species, an ecosystem, the biosphere. Organisms from this perspective are fungible, valued for their role in perpetuating the larger unit, but individually dispensable. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we could uh, consider what we call the individualist interpretation, which has it that you should care about the good of individual animals, not just aggregates, right? Um, and uh, I take it the sort of secular analog of the environmentalist interpretation is what governs actual wildlife management. Um, uh, Holmes Rolston uh, has this famous passage, you know, hundreds of elk starve every year, the wildlife service doesn't care in the slightest. Uh, if even maybe a much smaller number of grizzly bears uh, starved, then they would be very worried because what they're worried about is just maintaining biodiversity, maintaining species. If particular animals have a bad time, uh, that's not even regarded as, as of concern uh, to the wildlife managers. Um, but of course, if we take this view, then interventionism will be much less attractive because interventionism is concerned about welfare, about the welfare of particular individual animals. Um, and some interventionist proposals, eliminating certain parasites, uh, rewriting things, whatever, uh, might reduce biodiversity. Um, so I, I take it, first of all, that uh, the environmentalist interpretation famous faces another hermeneutical problem. Uh, the passages I mentioned earlier seem uh, concerned about the welfare of particular animals. Um, it wouldn't be very uh, reassuring if uh, Jesus said, uh, uh, look, you know, you worry about what's going to happen to you, but like God makes sure that sparrows continue to exist as a species. Um, well, okay, but I wasn't, I mean, maybe that suggests humans will continue to exist as a species too, but that doesn't, what does that mean for me? Uh, that's compatible with anything whatsoever happening to me, right? Um, and then there's also a kind of a philosophical objection to um, the problem with killing the 10,000 happy cows is not that, you know, cows are endangered or something. Um, Reagan suggests that purely environmentalist perspectives uh, constitute a form of what he calls environmental fascism uh, because they, they totally don't care about the individual or their welfare. They only care about this aggregate and there's something messed up about that. Um, I guess that uh, the, the end of the new world screw worm in North America reduced biodiversity, but um, that seems good to me, probably seems good to most of you. Um, and so uh, I think the individualist interpretation is better. Um, you could have views on which, you know, you should be concerned about both aggregates and uh, the welfare of individual animals. Um, and uh, I, I take it the foregoing considerations will say, okay, but we should at least be concerned about individual animals enough that we should be interested in these sorts of proposals. Um, so uh, we wind up with a view on which um, God has sort of charged us with uh, a certain special responsibility to govern the natural world um, for the good of its inhabitants, um, where that means not just uh, maintaining biodiversity and preserving species and this sort of stuff, but also trying to promote the, the good of actual particular inhabitants, trying to, trying to uh, promote the flourishing of, of wild animals. Um, and if that's true, uh, and this will be the last little bit of the talk, if that's true, uh, then it would undermine, I think, some of the anti-interventionist arguments that I mentioned back at the beginning. Um, so Claire Palmer wants to argue maybe positive duties, such as the duty to help, only arise in the context of certain special relationships. Um, but uh, on my view, we do stand in a certain sort of special relationship with the wild animals. Um, we've, we've been appointed as their stewards. Um, John Hadley uh, thinks, well, you know, your obligations to distant strangers are comparatively weak. Uh, you still have them, but 
uh, they're much weaker than your obligations to people who are around you or to whom you have uh, uh, some sort of special, special obligation. Um, but again, on the view that I've defended, uh, we do stand in a certain special relation with the wild animals, even if they are physically distant from us or something like that. Um, and so that would, uh, that would mean potentially that even if intervening to help them was quite costly, we might, we might still uh, have the obligation. Um, there's this sovereignty view that I mentioned earlier. Um, but uh, of course, if God is sort of sovereign over everything and has tasked us with, uh, uh, you know, has delegated to us a special sort of authority um, to intervene in the natural world for the benefit of its inhabitants, then there might not be any kind of deontic uh, uh, objection to our doing so. Uh, which isn't to say that just any, I mean, it could still be that the sovereignty model of wild animal communities has something to be said for it and we shouldn't intervene willy nilly, but uh, at least the certain class of reasons for intervention, um, exercises of the authority for the, the purpose for which the authority was delegated. Um, there might not be any, any obligation uh, not to do that. Um, Christine Korsgaard, she has a very kind of complicated, I guess I won't go into this. She has a very kind of complicated worry about uh, how intervening um, uh, to help wild animals would constitute playing God in an objectionable sense, even though she doesn't believe in God, uh, it would objectionably constitute playing God. Uh, I think that what I say would undermine that too. Um, and then just a final little point. Um, <laughs> People claiming divine authority don't necessarily have the best track record. Uh, you look at how uh, you know popes uh, have behaved, and uh, you know husbands, and uh, all sorts of folks like this, kings throughout history. Um, you might worry that this sort of approach, maybe, maybe belief in dominion is just like so. It's been misused so much; it's just no longer uh, you know any any sort of. Um, a uh, fruitful framework through which to view any of these topics. Um, and I do worry about that. Here's what I'm inclined to say though. Um, I think that people who are inclined to mistreat animals will probably do it whatever I say. Um, on the other hand, I do think that there are people who are like genuinely well-intentioned who are, who are sympathetic to some of these anti-interventionist arguments. Um, and of course, the anti-interventionist arguments have kind of a natural, uh, a natural advantage too, because uh, they don't require that we do anything. Uh, you know, you don't have to bear the costs of intervening. And lots of people find intervention kind of bizarre. And you know, like I said, I think there are certain cognitive biases that cause people to underrate the reasons in favor for it. Um, and uh, I take it if intervention could really work and sort of seriously altering um, the balance of suffering and flourishing uh, in the natural world in a positive direction, then even if we dilly dally for like one month, that could be really, really bad. If you think about trillions of wild animals and just how many wild animals are dying uh, in misery every day, uh, it could be really, really bad if we delay this at all. Um, and if we delay it indefinitely, that could be really, really, really bad. Um, and so um, I guess the suggestion here is, <clears throat> um, you know, maybe we should be interested in, in arguments, um, even if they, they, you know, in some ways have sketchy track records, uh, maybe we should be interested in arguments that, um, provide provide grist for for the pro interventionist side just because really well intentioned people uh, people who might be susceptible to arguments um, could bring about very very bad outcomes um, at least in my view if they wind up uh, you know going for the anti interventionist side so that's that's the talk I hope that made sense um, I guess I can stop how do I stop sharing this. Awesome, thank you. Um, I'll clap, everyone clap in whatever way works for you over Zoom. But thank you, that was really nice. Um, so we have a Q&A now, and I'm just gonna put this link, 
the link one more time in the chat. Um, I'm just going to go generally by what has the most votes. So, okay. So, Anonymous asks The New World screwworm is in itself an animal. How do you think about the ethics of eradicating one species to help the others? Yeah. Um, hopefully, uh, they're not sentient. Um, and I'm inclined to think that there is an important moral difference between sentient and non sentient animals. Um, so if they're not sentient, I think um, it's not a problem. Um, if they are, then I do think that we have obligations to them. Um, though the, the way that the New World screw worm was eliminated was actually not, it wasn't through like spraying a bunch of pesticide. It was through um, uh, like... Uh, releasing uh, like sterilized members and this causes them to, to not uh, reproduce very effectively. And the, the sort of gene drive based means of kind of trying to phase out parasitic species like this often work in that way. Um, so then you might, um, you might uh, eliminate the aggregate and thereby help a lot of other animals without actually harming any particular individual member, unless you think that it's uh, bad that, that the member not reproduce, uh, you know, for its own sake, that's bad or something like that. Um, and then if we go for this individualist interpretation, uh, it might not be quite, quite so bad um, that you eliminate the aggregate because you're not causing pain or death to any particular individual. Um, if you think, I mean, in a case where we have to actually kill them in some painful way, uh, or if you think, no, it's sort of prima facie wrong even to do that, what I just said, maybe that constitutes some sort of wrong to the individuals or something, then you get into the, the hard question of weighing, weighing interests against each other, that sort of stuff. Um, I guess I am inclined to think that probably the, the pain that it causes to mammals and things is just so significant that um, and it's, it, if we don't do anything, it will just happen forever. You, you can you always have these individuals causing pain. It's not like you can reach some sort of accommodation with the screw worms or something, right? Uh, and get them to stop. Um, so I'm inclined to think that it would be okay to do it even then. Um, though then you do have real, real balancing issues that you have to work out. Awesome, thanks. Um, okay. All right, so Alex asks, what should we make of animal suffering pre-humans for the problem of evil? Um, so do any of the justifications for that affect wild animal suffering as a cause area? Yeah. Um, it might. I mean, I guess what you would need to if you thought like you have the correct theodicy and the correct theodicy entails that sort of this system as a whole is good. Uh, and, you know, we would lose something really good if we intervened um, to reduce uh, the amount of suffering or something. Um, then you could, you could maybe run that sort of argument. Um, I guess I'm inclined to think maybe two things. I mean, First of all, a lot of theodicies would not have that result. I mean, if you think, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, if it's because of some primordial demonic fall, for instance, um, or if you think some people think um, maybe this is it, there's some sort of value in orderly laws of nature um, and that this system that's governed by elegant orderly laws of nature, you know, will result in natural evils and this sort of stuff. Well, if we, I mean, if we intervene to help the wild animals, it's not like we're violating laws of nature or anything. Um, so that would be perfectly consistent. Um, uh, and I think there are a number of other things like that, you might say. Um, also, I guess if, if my, um, 
I mean, if my reading of the dominion command is right, and we take that seriously as a theological idea, you might think, well, whatever God's reason for allowing wild animal suffering is, it must be that it's not going to get screwed up by us intervening, because <laughs> he's told us that we should be worried about this stuff, right? So presumably he thought about that. Um, so I think those are the two things I would say. Cool. Thanks. All right. So Lorenzo asks about the Bible story where Jesus exercises this demon called Legion and it like goes into a bunch of pigs and they all sort of like leap off a cliff. Um, what does that, how does this influence our view of like God and animals and our relationship? To them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So the story about the gathering swine. Um, it's so, I mean, historically, people, a number of people did take this to show that we have no obligations uh, to animals. Um, Augustine uh, thinks this, for instance. Um, I think, I guess I would recommend Richard Balkum's discussion of this in that book that I mentioned. Uh, uh, it's important to note, I mean, it's kind of an odd story. Um, Jesus shows up, he tells the, the demons to leave and they don't do it. They start trying to argue with him. Um, and uh, ultimately, ultimately he gets them to go out and they go into the pigs. Um, Bauckham's thought is uh, something like, uh, you know, I mean, we, we, we're, we, we kind of assume, Bertrand Russell also talks about these, about the pigs. And he says, look, Jesus was omnipotent. He could have just, you know, made them go anywhere else, right? Um, it doesn't quite seem in the story like that's the case. It seems like maybe he, he has some sort of power over them, but maybe not totally limited power, particularly given that there are so many of them and he's in this kind of faithless area and whatever. Um, and Bauckham thinks um, uh, maybe uh, the concern is that they're, they're going to linger around and possess more people uh, if he just... Uh, sends them out and doesn't give them anywhere to go. Uh, and that's why he lets them go into the pigs. Um, you might also think, I mean, you know, God, God in heaven, right, was letting the, the demons torment this guy. And you don't think, oh, well, that shows that, you know, human beings don't matter or whatever. Um, so it, it's part of the story that there's some reason or other for God to let demons wreak some amount of havoc. Uh, maybe that's why Jesus lets them wreak a little bit more havoc. I mean, it does seem like he, he values, um, the life of, he values saving this guy maybe more than he values this herd of pigs. Um, there are supposed to be, I think, 2,000 pigs in the story, which, so I'm told, is like a preposterous number. You know, it, it couldn't, like, historically, there, there wouldn't really be such a large herd of pigs there. Um, so who knows how many pigs there really were if this was a historical event. But, um, yeah, I think it's, I mean, it's a weird story in a lot of ways. Um, and I think it's, it's just, it's pretty dicey to try to conclude, um, that we don't have any obligations to animals from it, particularly in light of other sources of evidence for thinking that we do. Um, yeah. If I may add to my question uh, real quick, because I'm really fascinated by this answer. So, because on one hand, right, the pigs are capable of being demon possessed, which means that on some level, they must have an analogous container for a soul, right? Mm -hmm. That's one way you can interpret it. But do you think that because Jesus is prioritizing exercising the man over the pigs, that it might be a justification for animal testing? Oh. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say that I'm, I mean, even quite apart from that question, I'm okay with some forms of animal testing. Now, lots of animal testing is done for purposes that are, are not sufficiently important. Um, and I think that the interests of the animals are not properly taken into account in actual animal testing, but in, you know, if we just stipulate some idealized case where we really are sure that we're going to have some medical benefit that's going to seriously benefit a lot of people and blah, blah, blah. Um, I am inclined to think that animal testing would be okay in that sense. Um, again, even apart from anything having to do with the story, but, um, 
e even though, again, I want to stress lots of actual animal testing, not so good. Um, Awesome, thanks. All right, so Ryan asks, the notion of predation, or, as the idea that like sort of predation is this post fall reality, doesn't mm. sit super well with the theory of evolution. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> how does this affect our understanding of God's creation of the world? Yeah, yeah, good. So I'm assuming that there's some sort of we can like read the story theologically um and come away with the idea that predation is is somehow not not part of the ideal scheme or whatever um even though then you have uh this this odd <laughs> historical problem right um and there are kind of two ways to go um one is to say no there really is some sort of fall that is is responsible for evolutionary evils um and people get you know all sorts of um uh my friend hud hudson has a whole explanation involving hyper time about how the human fall could have uh uh could have um uh uh, been responsible for for evils that happened uh, in this timeline before there were human beings, this sort of thing. Um, if we don't go that route, um, it might still be that, um, you know, God foresees that there's going to be predation, but he doesn't will it. It's, it's some sort of bad side effect of uh, him setting up the world in a certain way for some other good reason. And so it might still be that we can take away the moral that predation is like not a good thing and it's good for us to get rid of it, even if it isn't literally the case that um, there was some sort of, you know, initial different plan that got screwed up at some point or something like that. Um, so I think, uh, let's see, what does this say here? Um, yeah, I think that, uh, I think that the story suggests that predation is not part of the, I mean, what is part of part of the initial design? I mean, it could be that it's um, it's a, a foreseen lamentable consequence of the initial design or something like that. Um, it seems to at least suggest that it's not like uh, God is like, yes, this is one of the reasons I made the world this way is so that animals bleed each other. You know, that's part of the point uh, or something like that. Um, and that would be enough maybe to get my, my conclusions. Um, I'm, I'm actually more sympathetic myself to some of these, some of these, uh, weirdo theodicies where maybe somehow it, it turns out that free will, uh, abuse of free will is responsible for natural evils, but lots of people, everybody, you know, lots of people think that's just too weird, too problematic. Um, and I think we can say the other thing if that's so. Awesome, thanks. Um, so. Okay, so Kate is asking for your thoughts on human land use, so particularly agriculture and housing. Given that the world is sort of approaching 10 billion people, um, how does this fact that we now have to use all this land relate to wild animal suffering and what can we do about this? Yeah. Um... I guess I mean there is a there is a certain camp of um, anti wild animal suffering people who say oh that's great because probably wild animals have net negative lives so if we just pave as much as we can there will be fewer of them they won't suffer as much um, uh, I think it's it's well maybe among other things it's actually far from clear that that overall uh, there's more um suffering than flourishing in the wild though there is quite a lot of suffering um and then you might also worry about whether that would be the right thing to do even if it even if it was true <laughs> um but uh yeah so I, I guess one one route is okay maybe it's actually good if we just destroy the world because it's uh, there's too much suffering out there um supposing that's not true um 
uh, yeah, I guess we would have to think about it pretty seriously, right? I mean, you know, we we have to live our own lives, I guess, but um, uh, you want to do it in ways that have negative, minimal negative uh, effects. And I guess I think in land use cases, I mean, there are lots of reasons why inefficient land use is bad anyway, apart from wild animal stuff. I mean, you know, suburbs um, result in, you know, people have to drive a whole lot more and that's bad for the environment and it's bad for public health and people get in car accidents. And um, so I, I think, yeah, Maybe I'm getting on. I'm getting onto my anti-car hobby horse now. When I lived in Germany, I could take the public transit everywhere. And now I'm back in America, and I have to drive, and I hate it. I hate it. So yeah, no, we should have better land use, and you know, get people to live in dense communities with public transit and this sort of stuff. And that that's good for um, you know, that's more efficient land use, and that's probably good for the environment. And that's also good for us. And yeah, there's another world maybe where I became an urban planner instead of a instead of a philosopher and um, try to design train routes or something. I don't know, but uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's an important question, um, and probably yeah, we should try to move towards more efficient land use for a, a range of reasons. One of which might be respect for wild animals. Cool. Thanks. All right, so we're getting close to the end of our time. So I'm gonna ask one last question, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, I don't know, if people have fully gotten into your arguments so far, like, you know, we wanna stop wild animal suffering, we wanna be interventionists, how would intervention look in practice? Um, and specifically, I guess I would be worried that like, I'm going to intervene to help like this moose and I'm going to screw up the ecosystem and cause way more suffering. Like how should we think about intervening in a sort of ethical mm -hmm. way? <clears throat> I think there are some things, I mean, eliminating certain parasites that don't seem to serve an ecological niche and um, that cause really, really intense suffering, uh, like the new world screw worm. I think there are some things where and so far as we can adequately judge the consequences of anything we're going to do, it seems like probably that's just going to be a good thing. Um, it is true, though, when it comes to like more drastic interventions, um, it is, I mean, it's an immensely complicated problem to figure out what are all the knock on consequences of these things going to be. And so probably one of the things we need to do is lots of foundational research in welfare biology and in related fields. Um, just so that we can figure out how to intervene um, effectively. Um, and uh, maybe, I mean, maybe it will turn out that we can't with a sufficient degree of confidence in the end. Um, but even, even in that case, I mean, because, because intervening could be so good, I think it's worth putting a lot of resources into it, you know, exhausting all our options, figuring out what all the possibilities are. Um, so yeah, one thing to do, I think, would be support, you know, organizations like the Wild Animal Initiative that are trying to do research like this. And I don't know if you're in a position to do research yourself, do that or whatever. I mean, um, and yeah, we we need um, we need to know a lot more before we can effectively do the real a lot of the really big scale stuff um, with any degree of confidence about what the overall effects are going to be. So. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. Um, yeah. Let's thank Dustin again. Someday we'll figure out how to clap for people <laughs> and not awkward. Man. Um, cool. So I'm going to close this so that the people next here can reopen it. Um, but yeah, the next session start in seven minutes. So enjoy. Oh, Dustin, before you go, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, perhaps, um, I know it may, you may have uh, mentioned it, uh, but uh, would it be possible to sort of, I'm going to use the term, sell the idea of expanding uh, interventions to help wild animals as 
like as an extension of what's currently in practice, such as rescuing, you know, injured birds or, or whatnot, or abandoned orangutans. I would say perhaps these organizations uh, that are already in uh, extent have the, the greatest leeway. Unfortunately, and you've probably, you know, encountered a lot of them have this sort of, uh, you know, hands-off approach to the rest of the ecology, but. Uh, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, I think so. And this is actually in, in this applied ethics book that I co-authored, this is an example that we talk about is people already do things that are seem to be aimed at helping individual wild animals, um, like, you know, rescuing a bird whose mother has died or this sort of stuff. Um, and uh, then some, somehow once you scale that up enough, people start to get very wary about it. Um, but in principle, it's hard to see why the one thing would be okay and, and the others aren't, I think. Um, so yeah, I, I do think we could view it as an extension of these sorts of things that we, we already are inclined to think are, are good things to do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, it is now our hard cutoff, so I do have to ask. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. <laughs>